Thank you everybody for your patience and thank you for joining us for today's presentation on overcoming complex system integration challenges. My name is Joe Chasen and I'm a marketing manager for Nudesic and the moderator for today's webinar, which, we, which will be presented by Sam Kashambuzi, who is the head of investors for content technology at Thomson Reuters. At the end of today's presentation, we will also hear briefly from Marty Wozniki, general manager of Neuron ESB. If you are properly logged in to go to webinar, you should see the title slide which says Overcoming Complex System Integration Challenges at Thomson Reuters. If anyone is having problems seeing this, please exit and re-enter the webinar using the link provided to you upon registration. We will start things off with a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be set to mute for the duration of this presentation. Please also make sure your phone or headset is muted on your end to avoid any background noise. We strongly encourage attendees to ask questions throughout the session by typing them into the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Please note that all questions will be held until the end, at which time the speakers will field questions that are asked. At this time, I'd like to introduce Sam Kashambuzi. Thank you, Joe. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar. I hope that you find it uh, useful and informative. Um, I'm going to start just by giving you a bit of background about myself, um, and then we'll jump right into the presentation. Um, I've been building software and systems for about 17 years. Um, every time I, I say that, it, it amazes me at how quickly time flies. Um, I started off doing banking systems, uh, you know, back office uh, type systems, general ledger, accounting, you know, financial management reporting. Um, and then I went over to Bloomberg where I built equity analytics uh, for a couple of years, uh, followed by a few, you know, a few years at a, uh, a hedge fund doing pretty much everything from racking and stacking servers uh, to uh, writing software, doing system integrations and supporting uh, traders on, on, the, on the trading desk. So pretty much touched just about everything you can imagine. Um, after that, I started my own consulting company, uh, basically doing custom software development for my clients. Uh, Thomson Reuters happened to be one of them. I, and that's where I got introduced to data, um, lots of data. Um, three years as a contractor, uh, I decided to join full time uh, as a development manager where I continue to work uh, with uh, content-oriented types of systems. Um, so, you know, been through a lot, done a lot. Um, the last 10 years predominantly um, around uh, content uh, processing uh, systems. So, uh, today before we get into the nitty-gritty around uh, Neuron and how we're using it, uh, I thought it was important to give you a bit of a background uh, of Thomson Reuters. Uh, it's always good to give some context so that uh, you get a sense of how, um, in this case, uh, you know, a platform like Neuron uh, you know, plays in, in, in terms of what we do here at, at Thomson Reuters. I'll talk to you about some of the challenges that we were dealing with um, that forced us to think differently around the way we build uh, our systems. Um, talk about the goals of uh, my group um, and uh, then, you know, based on those goals, you know, how we approach solving some of those challenges. Um, and, and and how Neuron um, came to be one of the uh, the uh, um, technologies that we use to solve those uh, those problems. All right, then I think it would be good to go through some examples of how we knew, use Neuron to solve those integration challenges, uh, and then talk a little bit about how uh, we're optimizing infrastructure cost being one of our, our our main challenges, and how Neuron makes that easy and easier for us to do. Uh, then I'll wrap up a little bit, and, and at that point, I'll, I'll hand over to Joe uh, to continue the, uh, the presentation. So Thomson Reuters, uh, what is Thomson Reuters? Um, a lot of people probably know it, our, our Reuters uh, name, uh, not so much the Thomson name. In fact, we used to joke around about how Thomson was the biggest company you never heard of. Um, but what Thomson Reuters does is we provide information to our customers. We're, we're, we're an information business at the heart um, of what we do. Uh, and most of the information that we provide, ironically, is available publicly. Uh, but where we add value is that we bring this information together, we integrate it, and we add value so that the information is more insightful to our customers. Right? Uh, our customers essentially are in three different uh, groups, financial and risk, 
which pretty much uh, focuses on the financial business, banks, hedge funds, uh, uh, those types of organizations. Our legal business that supports lawyers and law firms um, with a lot of legal information. We pretty much digitize a lot of the legal briefs uh, and findings. Uh, tax and accounting supports our, our accountants, and then IP and science supports uh, scientists, journalists, researchers. A lot of the journals that are written, uh, we digitize them, tag them, um, make them searchable, etc. Right? Um, we we sell feeds uh, and desktop products um, uh, for the most part. Um, my organization, Investors Content Technology, is aligned with financial and risk. All right. So in the financial industry, um, I manage a pretty large dispersed team, uh, globally dispersed team of 270 engineers and QA uh, testers. Uh, and what we do is we're the guys that build the databases that contain much of the information that's uh, sold to our customers uh, in the way of desktop products and feeds. All right. So you can imagine the petabytes of data that we manage and process. Uh, that's the size of our databases today. We, we, uh, we process terabytes of data every day. Right, and our job is to acquire that content, so build systems to acquire that content, process that content, um, what we call mastering, which is creating a single version of the truth for each of those pieces of content that we uh, we ingest, and then we deliver that content out to our product teams who build those desktop products and feed products around our content. Right, so as you can see, at the heart of our business is our content. Our information is what we sell. Right. Um, when you look at the way we're organized, my team that is, uh, is we're organized around content, what we call content sets, right? And this information, um, when you look historically, was directly tied to a product, right? So, you know, uh, bankers or, or hedge fund managers or traders would buy content and buy products that were aligned around that content. So if a trader wanted to see a balance sheet, he would essentially be querying our uh, fundamentals database, right? our company financials database. We'll build a product that was targeted around uh, um, financial um, reports. Right? Uh, if you wanted to know uh, who held what equities, you would essentially be querying our ownership database and would have a view of a product that was pretty much centered and focused around ownership content. Right? Um, and th this is how you know, our, our content sets were organized and, and, and pretty much each content that was aligned directly with the product, right? And a lot of this happened because as we grew, grew through acquisition, um, we were buying products that were aligned around these content sets, right? Um, and what you ended up, ha ended up having was uh, our content databases directly tied to our products, those tight coupling between these two, uh, these two assets uh, because those products were about those content sets, right? Now, as we started amassing these assets, Right? We began to realize that there were opportunities to uh, find some cost synergies right? by eliminating uh, duplicate flows or duplicate databases. Right? Uh, so each of these content sets, you know, a financial report is tagged to a company. Right? If you want to know who owns IBM, you want to, you know, you, you, you essentially attach that information to an organization, IBM. So we did things like eliminate you know, uh, duplicate company databases. Um, what we also started doing was realizing that our content was a lot more valuable integrated and used together, right? So we started building more sophisticated views of our content, um, which meant that we had display content next to each other, um, which initially uh, essentially led to us copying data from databases to databases, integrating flows from one database to another. Um, so what ended up happening over time was we amassed a vast web of data flows and interconnections um, that became very, very difficult to manage. Right? Uh, at the time, it made sense when you're dealing with smaller infrastructures, but as we continue to acquire companies and data sets and products, uh, it got you know, uh, obviously exponentially more, more complicated. Right? So basically, you know, this is uh, the challenge that we are, we are dealing with, uh, is something that looks like this. Right? Um, you know, I, I manage 14 content sets, so essentially I have 14 different versions of this. And uh, the intent here is not to be able to read that, but to get a sense of the complexity that we're dealing with in terms of our workflows and our system integration challenges, right? Um, what we ended up with is, you know, large monolithic um, infrastructures representing 
you know, uh, a content set and it's, it's many complex flows down to our products and to other content sets. Um, these, these were very, very complex uh, flows that, you know, over time um, documentation was lost. Uh, there's very, very tight coupling between applications, both, both on the content side and between content and product. Um, it, a lot of these, these, these assets were bought many, many years ago. Um, so we're dealing with aging technologies, a lot of Power Builder, for example, a Sybase, we have Postgres databases. Pretty much any technology you can imagine, we have somewhere in our infrastructure, right? And as we integrated with our systems, we just kept on adding boxes, right? Because we had to put logic in places to, uh, to perform this integration, right? A lot of this sort of stuff is, uh, you know, scripts that we write that read from one database to another, right? Uh, applications that are generating content, writing content to databases. Um, so as, as, as we did more and more of this, the uh, infrastructure grew uh, to uh, very large numbers, right? Uh, but when you start thinking about, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of working this way, you begin to realize how exorbitant it gets, right? Uh, first of all, uh, the cost of getting um, updates and enhancements out uh, grows, grows very, uh, very, very, very big, right? We have to understand the impact of doing an enhancement upstream on a downstream product that might be on a client site. Right? So you need to be very, very careful around how you make some of these enhancements, right? Um, you know, the complex flows force you to uh, take more care in terms of the way you do your deployments, right? That takes more time. Understanding, uh, you know, the impact of the requirements that are being requested uh, takes a lot longer, right? So time to market increases, uh, you know, in, in a big way, right? Uh, when you look at the way we organize our content sets, right, uh, we duplicate effort in terms of functionality. All these systems do essentially the same thing. They acquire content, they process that content, they load databases, they generate uh, new data by deriving uh, analytics, and we push data out to our products, right? By working in this siloed way, we're pretty much duplicating effort, right, uh, across each of these infrastructures. You can imagine how much we're spending on power, space, and cooling. Uh, we have many data centers across the world where uh, our infrastructure is hosted. Um, we need to find a way to consolidate, right? And we're actively working on, on that, which has implications on how we, in content technology, build our systems, right? Um, and then you can imagine the support and maintenance nightmare that our operations teams have to deal with. Uh, but perhaps I think the biggest cost uh, is our people, right? Because you need to have people with uh, lots of skill sets to manage, uh, you know, these technologies, right? Because we have, uh, as I said earlier, a number of technologies that we have to support, right, from a, from a uh, development perspective. And then not to mention uh, the resources we need just to support all of these, uh, these systems, right? Um, so when you look at our goals, right, um, our goals are to contain our cost, obviously, as an organization. Uh, profitability is important. Making our shareholders happy is uh, a key objective of ours. And when you look at what drives our cost base um, in, in technology, we're talking about hardware, right? Uh, lots and lots and lots of hardware. In my development lab alone, uh, I have something on the order of, you know, 300 servers. In production, I have something on the order of 3,000 servers, right? So hardware is a, a very big cost, and we cannot continue uh, to throw uh, hardware at our problems, right? Uh, software licenses, again, um, very, very high cost in licenses, data centers, operations, um, the, the vast array of, of people that we have with varying skill sets. And, and I think the most important is losing business because we can't react quickly enough to our customers, right? Uh, these are real costs that we uh, we have to get under control, and as a result, every technology decision we make has to be in the context of reducing our cost, right? And then the cost that is not appa not not, not uh, apparent on the surface is the complexity cost, right? I showed you that diagram, that picture, that demonstrates just how complicated our infrastructures become when we're not careful about the, how we we design our solutions, right? Uh, many times, for good reason. Um, uh, expediency uh, drives how we make our decisions. And I, I understand that, right? I understand the, uh, the pressures that our business people face. But we need to be smarter around the way we design our systems so that we, uh, we don't trade in short-term gains for uh, 
long uh, for long term um, uh, for long term problems, right? So uh, we have to look at how we reduce our complexity, right? Now the problem is that we never really had a process and methodology to figure out how to do this, right? How do we make these changes to our applications so that we can derive benefit to our customers? Um, you know, uh, what we did was we took some time. I think we started about two years ago. We started looking at our systems and our infrastructure, and we started making uh, some informed decisions around what direction to take. Right, looking at technologies, understanding our, our problems, looking at a long-term view of the type of projects that we're going to be doing, and then figuring out how we can converge all these things into a strategy that made sense. Right, and uh, uh, about you know towards the the end of 2011 we sort of started coming up with this new idea, a new approach to uh, building our application, and I'll talk about that uh, in the next slide. So our approach, right? So before we get into the approach, th there's something that, you know, uh, was clearly apparent to us uh, when we started looking at this, uh, this exercise. The, the reality is that the complex systems uh, that we have, the, the picture that I showed you earlier, that's what generates our revenue, right? That's how we pay our bills. And we realized quickly that there's no way we could just wholesale abandon that infrastructure and start building for the future, right? We had to keep it going. And, and, and the reality was it's, it's going to be years before we actually move off a lot of this aging technology, right? Um, and the reality is that there's a lot of business logic and IP built into uh, a lot of those components. Not all of them, but a lot of them do have a lot of value to us, right? So we had to recognize where the value was, and we had to uh, understand that we, whatever we built, we needed, we needed to have a way to integrate with, uh, with that legacy infrastructure until our products uh, changed or something downstream of those applications changed where it was no longer necessary, right? But at the same time, we also realized that we cannot continue to build on top of that complexity, right? With every technology project you do, uh, if you're building on top of that complexity, you're just making the problem worse, right? So we had to come up with a solution, an approach, where we could leverage legacy where it made sense, but at the same time build new, right, um, and, and, and begin to slowly untangle the vast web of complexity we've been building over the last 20 years or so, right? So uh, in, in, in broad terms, our approach to cost control um, and to obviously limiting complexity is to simplify the way we work, right? Uh, which meant sunset legacy where it made sense, uh, where legacy was no longer creating value but just driving up cost. Um, build new function functionality, right? Uh, and build it in a way that it drives real value for our customers. Uh, our business people are not going to wait years uh, to get something out to market. They have to react quickly. So it had to be incremental in nature, right? Um, and what was obvious to us was the only way to do this uh, and to do it in a way that was achievable was to uh, do to, to, was to go solo, right? You use a service-oriented approach to building our applications. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier that a lot of our applications essentially do the same kinds of things, right? And as a result, uh, what makes sense is to build reusable components, uh, what we call content services. Um, deploy them as services and build composable applications around those services, right? Um, we had to ensure that we continue to enforce loose coupling between our systems, right? A lot of our engineers were used to uh, building in databases, right? I mean, that's what we do. And, um, you know, database people love databases and, um, you know, as a result, we tightly in integrated our databases together, right? So enforcing um, Loose coupling was a priority for us, right? In every, especially for the new things that we were building. We didn't want to build new things that we essentially tightly coupled to uh, legacy applications that were going to go away, right? Um, and then where 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 uh, where necessary, we had to make sure that we integrated all of our new functionality with those valuable assets uh, that deliver uh, content downstream to uh, to our products, and, and in many cases that delivery chain all along uh, the route, right, is, is doing some very, very sophisticated, complex logic that's, that's very difficult to, to replace in a short period of time. So we really had no choice but to integrate back into some portions of the existing workflows. So integration was a key challenge that we had to ensure uh, we could solve, right? So 
I hope that that gives you a good background, a good context into um, the problems that we're 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 solving. Um, and uh, at this point, I think yeah, it would be it would be good to talk about how we're using neuron to solve those complex integration challenges, right? And and cost challenges as well, right? Um, so uh, I I put together a couple of slides that contain some examples that I want to walk you guys through uh, to demonstrate you know where neuron. Uh, plays a role in solving uh, in solving some of these problems. Okay, so we got introduced to Neuron, um, I'd say about two and a half years ago, okay, and this is about the time when we started really thinking hard around um, a technology strategy, right, um, and a lot of the focus was around workflows and simplifying workflows. Uh, so we started looking at um, you know BPM type solutions from all the big guys Oracle, IBM, Pega Systems, um, and uh, Neuron was was uh, one of the technologies that we looked at, and it was because we had a relationship with Nudesic. Uh, one of my uh, my architects was closely um, associated with Nudesic, and we took a look at it. Look at it, and uh, at that point, you know, we didn't really see the value in it, right? Uh, but we started talking with Marty and the team about Nudesic and about its capabilities. And we decided, you know, let's take a look at using it in some of our simpler uh, simpler cases. And I think part of that was because I don't think we had a real true appreciation of what uh, Neuron was capable of. Um, so uh, this is one of the projects that we uh, executed very early on. And it was relatively simple. You know, we had two systems. One was a content systems, our deals transaction systems, basically where we, uh, we maintain all of our mergers and acquisitions data, right? So, um, you know, Microsoft buys a company, uh, we, we record the details of that transaction in this database. And, and part of, uh, uh, of that process is generating a bunch of analytics, right? Uh, ratios, uh, this sort of thing um, that, you know, uh, provide a lot more insight into that transaction, right? Today, a lot of that, back before we did this project, a lot of that data, uh, the analytics were embedded in stored procedures and, uh, you know, arcane C++ code, and we wanted to move towards a more centralized analytics platform. Um, and that was as a result of, of, of an acquisition that we acquired that, that uh, analytics platform. So what we had to do was essentially send a bunch of data from our deals application over to the analytics platform the analytics platform does the calculations and sends them back to our deals application. And by doing this, we could eliminate a lot of that, you know, uh, old SQL code and C++ code um, over time, right? So we needed a way to integrate these two systems together in, in a loosely coupled way, right? Um, the uh, analytics platform is a uh, C++ application running on a farm of uh, Windows machines. The deals application is basically Power Builder front end, uh, Oracle database, um, and uh, some Windows some Windows applications where we run some logic, right? And what you can see in this picture here is that from the deals database, we would send a payload of information um, over to Neuron. Uh, we essentially use the Neuron client connector capability to provide the integration, right? Basically, um, you know, send, send the data over to, to Neuron onto a request queue. Um, then we expose an, uh, an interface to our PAN calculator that exposes a web service. Uh, we build uh, a, a PAN uh, service connector using uh, an out-of-the-box functionality from Neuron. And basically, Neuron uh, forwards on the payload to the, uh, the PAN is persistent analytics. Uh, calculator where the calculation takes place. The, the beauty of Neuron here is we're able to throttle uh, the rate at which our messages are sent over to our calculator. Uh, our calculator does the calculations, right? Uh, passes the data back to Neuron um, using a client connector, um, and, and then Neuron forwards on the message uh, to our deals database uh, where it, it processes the data and stores it in the database, right? So essentially, you know, what we're using here is the PubSub uh, capabilities in Neuron, basically using it as a, a message bus for the most part. But what made it uh, a lot easier to do was the fact that Neuron presented these 
client connectors and service connectors that allow us to easily integrate with Neuron and thereby easily integrate with the system on the other side, right? So this is a relatively straightforward example of how we use Neuron today to integrate our deals application where we store our deals transactions data with our analytics capability, right, in order to do those analytics and then send the data back to, uh, to, uh, to deals, right? So relatively straightforward, relatively simple. But as you saw from the, from the, uh, the, uh, the diagram earlier, our problem is a lot more complicated than that, right? Um, so we decided to, you know, uh, test the limits uh, further with Neuron, and um, this example uh, is a bit more complex, a little busier uh, when you look at it, but basically um, we had the need to integrate a number of our content uh, databases with a third-party supplier that did uh, some uh, work for us. I'm not at liberty to discuss specifically what that arrangement is, um, but essentially, um, a lot of the workflows in our uh, systems revolve around our filings, right? So a lot of uh, companies, public companies, are forced to file uh, documents with the SEC. Uh, we use our files repository for a lot more than that. Uh, we put all our company reports in there. And this is the starting point for a lot of our, uh, our workflows, right? So our, our filing system uh, essentially processes these documents from, um, uh, from the SEC. Um, and today what happens is any content set that needs access to the filings repository goes and gets the filings themselves, right? Uh, in, in many cases, duplicating uh, software that does that, right? Uh, we decided, look, it makes sense for us to be smarter about that. How about we just push out documents as they're, and the document metadata as it's coming in? And then uh, downstream systems can write business rules to figure out um, which documents are relevant to them, right? So in this case, what we did was we used an FTP adapter. These documents come in via FTP. The FTP ad adapter comes out of the box uh, from Neuron. What do we do today? Multiple systems are writing FTP scripts um, and putting them in cron jobs or scheduling them, whatever the case might be. We get rid of all that. We have one service now that runs inside Neuron that's responsible for looking for files that are coming to our FTP system and then publishing those files, right? So basically, uh, this, this system pushes a message onto a topic here called, called, called our filings router, right? And then we built a, uh, a subsystem uh, that's hosted inside Neuron called the, uh, the filings router, right? And its job is to uh, run a set of business rules, that uh, are defined by each of our content masters, the subscribers, and based on those rules, route the, uh, the document and the metadata to the subscriber, right? Um, what you see here in dark blue are all common shared components uh, that essentially uh, are uh, put together as an endpoint uh, on Neuron. Neuron gets up and starts running. All this logic starts running automatically, right? Um, we connect to reference databases to get uh, data that's used in those business rules. And then our Stargazer database here basically is the, is the, is the back-end database for um, our platform, uh, the, central, the, the central element being, uh, being Neuron, right? So once the rules are run and we know how to route the document, in this case, we put it onto this Delta topic over here. Um, and from there, uh, any content set um, can set up a, uh, a, we can set up a service connector on Neuron for, for each of our content sets. So it, we could have 13 of these, client, uh, of these uh, service connectors. Uh, and the purpose of the service connector is to be able to route uh, content payloads to subscribers. In this case, uh, the data is going to our, to our officers and directors database. And in this database, what we collect is information about officers and directors of companies. Um, so Nudesic uh, has, a, uh, or, or Nudesic has a, an officer, his name is Marty. Uh, this is who Marty is, uh, this is his title, this is his compensation. I know Marty, you don't want, you don't want to tell anybody your compensation. This is the bio about Marty, um, and uh, he's a member of, um, you know, these organizations, right? Uh, he's a board member of these organizations, right? So what we're doing is we need to, uh, we have a third party that's going to help us deal with how we manage that workflow, okay? so. We send the data over to, to officers and directors. Officers and directors does something with that payload. 
and that document. And then uh, you can see this outflow over here, number four. Uh, we have a load balancer uh, in front of all of our neuron instances. Um, so we spread this load across a number of, uh, of, of uh, neuron services. And uh, there's a client connector over here uh, that essentially takes that content back from Austin directors um, and, ma and makes it available to a component, this component down here, right, where we've encapsulated all of the logic to have this data routed to a third-party uh, provider, right, somebody who's outside of uh, uh, Thomson Reuters altogether, right? So in this case over here, we're integrating with an internal application that provides our filings. We are processing those filings, and then we are integrating with another internal system via the service connector um, that, sorry, uh, via the service connector over here um, that does some processing, right? So the payload goes out to our, uh, our third-party supplier. This component over here, okay, encapsulates an API provided by our third-party provider that does a number of things for us, okay? So what happens is the payload comes in, it gets processed, and you can notice uh, these red arrows uh, over here um, uh, are pretty much routes of, con of, of uh, monitoring content that, uh, uh, that's logged and sent over to our operations teams that monitor our applications. So each one of these components, basically, we've, we have built into Neuron monitoring capability, right? So whatever you build, use this interface, and you're able to provide monitoring and logging data automatically, right? The blue arrows um, are for audit information that's stored uh, locally in our Stargazer database, right? So once the payload comes to this CSAS component, okay, what it does is we have to upload a document to uh, the third-party supplier. This third-party supplier uh, incidentally uses Amazon Web Services uh, and, and, a, and a, uh, a, a document store, a uh, file store on, on Amazon. We built a doc upload a service. And what you see down here is another instance of, of, of Neuron where we store all of our, where we put all of our utility services, right? So this instance of Neuron here is dedicated to processing this data. This uh, instance of Neuron down here is where we put all of our utilities. So all the general type of functionality that we use across all of our capabilities, right? All of our, uh, all of our systems. One of those is a doc uploader service, right? So we call a doc, doc uploader client connector. The document then is uploaded using the API that's provided to us to Amazon Web Services, okay? Once that's done, all right, uh, the CSAS component over here registers the job with a third-party supplier by calling its API, right? And then we wait. There's a callback service here that calls through a firewall to an external connector that uh, the third-party supplier uses to pass the data back to us, okay? So it comes back in here. The payload is processed, right? And then what happens is... Um, the data flows back to the content set over here, uh, basically saying your job has been registered, okay? So this is a much more complex implementation using Neuron, right? Uh, what's new in this diagram that you didn't see in the other is uh, we're using things like FTP adapters. We're hosting our services inside Neuron, right? Uh, which has tremendous value to us in terms of managing um, how our, our software and services are deployed, right? We have built-in capability for monitoring, right? So any, any uh, solution that's deployed on Neuron now gets instantaneous monitoring. You don't have to worry about those things, right? And we're auditing as well, right? We're able to integrate with internal systems. We're able to integrate with external systems as well, relatively easily, right? And as you can see, we also can, um, can integrate between Neuron instances quite easily as well, right? I have one more example, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I'll run through this uh, uh, relatively quickly. Same, same sort of stuff. Um, we have uh, an internal system called Kapow, right, that we use to acquire a lot of our content, right? Uh, we can acquire content from websites by doing web scraping. We can also acquire content from uh, FTP servers. So what we're doing is we're now consolidating all of our FTP scripts on this platform called Kapow, right? In this case, we have to take party uh, data from third-party suppliers, right? This is all company-level data. 
uh, officers level data and financials for private companies, right? So we get literally millions and millions of companies uh, from around the world, right? Uh, initially, our focus was on public companies only, but we have a big push into private companies now because of uh, requirements from our banking business. Um, uh, we, we get large, large files that come in that need to be processed that contain millions and millions of rows, right? So we integrate our Kapow infrastructure, right, which downloads our files with another client connector. Again, you can, you can now see the themes here. The client connectors are very, very powerful, right, where essentially messages are dropped onto a topic, right, and then we have built an entire stack okay, of functionality here, right? They essentially process those files, right? Processing files is a big part of what we do. This stack now is, uh, is all reusable code to process um, our files, right? What do we do? We have a bunch of rules that we use to do validations on our files. This rules engine is reusable. Uh, we do our validations. We get we use a database manager to get all the rules into cache. We cache all our rules. And then this component essentially manages uh, processing the input files, right? Basically what we do is we process all the records. We batch them up. And then what we do is we send batches of data to be enriched and transformed. That's this flow over here. It's a, it's a, this dash line means it's, it's being broadcast. Um, and again, we have this implemented on a number of servers. Uh, so all this stuff is, is load balanced across a number of servers. And this is where all the record parsing happens. We parse our records. We do a lot of derived data. We do a lot of transformations. Again, business rules drive all of that. We cache all of our business rules. And we have components to access our databases, right? So this entire stack, this solution that's made up of these independent services uh, is, uh, is hosted inside Neuron as well, right? So multiple instances of Neuron have uh, this stack uh, ready to process records as they come in, or batches of records as they come in, right? Um, once uh, the records are processed, they flow back into the stack where we use out of the box capability to, uh, to join uh, from Neuron to join uh, the records back together before they are eventually written out to file, to disk, and then FTP'd out to the systems downstream that need that data, right? So again, similar, similar to the other one, integrating an internal system, right, uh, with with systems downstream uh, that will receive this data uh, via uh, via uh, FTP, right. So I'll move on. Um, so I want I just want to wrap up very very quickly by talking a little bit about um, how we're deploying uh, neuron across our infrastructure. Um, we started off with a, a four-node cluster of, of Windows servers, right, with, with, with SAN storage uh, behind. Um, I mentioned having multiple instances of uh, Neuron. One, in, in the example I gave, for example, would run the entire private company stack. Uh, the other would run that CSAS uh, application that, uh, that we reviewed. And then another uh, instance would run our utilities. So things like um, file uploading, We've recently released a, uh, a, uh, um, a shared capability to, to process and extract content from PDF documents. Um, we're going to be deploying a service to do language translation. Right? And these are all things that you know, uh, only need to be done once. It's a service that you call. You pass it a document. It translates the document from Spanish to English. It gives you back the translated document, right? these kinds of things. So we're going to have a utility instance of Neuron running with all those services uh, on it. And uh, each of those instances is deployed across all of our active servers and our passive server. All right? Uh, we have load balances running in front of, um, of, of these boxes, which means that all of those services and client connectors and service connectors you saw pretty much now are available across uh, a farm of servers. Right? And, uh, and when requests come in, uh, they're load balanced across uh, all the servers. Right? The passive server exists in case we lose one of these servers. When we lose one of these servers, the passive server takes over. Uh, and essentially, when it comes up, all the neural instances running on that server come up. They wake up and start uh, processing uh, requests that come in. All right? uh, so behind the servers, we have SAN storage, uh, where we store our files, et cetera. Our, our uh, MSMQ uh, queues, durable queues are stored on, on SAN storage. 
And then behind um, the, the, the uh, neuron servers, uh, we have a database. Neuron requires a database to store some objects. And we also use that database as a central repository for things like business rules, et cetera, et cetera, with a clustered pair uh, of servers, right? Uh, now, the beauty of this is that in the past, whenever we would deploy web services, we would either have to run Windows services on, on, on separate boxes or stand up IIS uh, servers, uh, et cetera. With Neuron, we host all those services on the Neuron boxes, right, which is huge, right? It means we don't proliferate servers for the, for, for the sake of proliferating them. We just host all our services inside Neuron, right? It makes life a lot easier for us, right? And this server, this server will just expand and grow horizontally as needed as we add new services to uh, our neuron, um, our our neuron uh, systems, right? So very, very well designed, much easier to support uh, from an operations perspective. Uh, Built-in monitoring, built-in logging, uh, all applications now in the past would have to consider would have to consider all these things, uh, essentially come for free now uh, with this type of deployment, right? Okay, so let me just wrap up very, very quickly before heading back to, uh, to Joe, right? And, and I wanted to make sure that this message really uh, was clear, right? You know, so go back to what our problems were. Um, cost avoidance, simplification, how is no one helping us, right? And how is no one helping us deliver uh, the, on this technology strategy by at the same time delivering real value to our customers through a lot of that existing infrastructure, right? The adapters, the client connectors, the service connectors, and the underlying pub sub, you know, topics are uh, are huge for us, right? It makes it extremely easy for us just to, con to configure an adapter to do FTP is a two-minute process, right? Uh, standing up a service connector that will route messages to an external service, um, whether it's an HTTP service, a REST service, uh, can be done literally in minutes, right? Um, these are very, very powerful features that come out of Neuron that make integration uh, a lot easier for you, right? Uh, I, I was skeptical when I first started working on Neuron until, you know, we walked through some of this stuff, and literally it, it is configuration, right? Um, so the, the, these, these components and these features are very, very powerful when it comes to integrating with external services and systems, right? Um, uh, encapsulating all the complexity around uh, how our messages get routed, right, uh, is is huge, right? The fact that Neuron can actually throttle service messages that are coming through the system and can forward on uh, payloads by calling external services uh, really makes life a lot easier for us, right? Secondly, um, leveraging Neuron as a hosting platform eliminates the need uh, to have to deploy to, um, you know, other servers, right? It makes it a lot easier for us now to build into Neuron all of our monitoring, right? Uh, which now becomes uh, immediately available to the solutions that we're building using uh, these reusable services, right? Failover now is built in, right? All of our services fail over a lot, you know, uh, instantaneously, right? Because we're uh, we're deployed across uh, across a uh, load balanced farm of, of of servers, right? And then deployment becomes a lot easier as well because there's only one place to deploy in Neuron, right? Uh, so it hugely simplifies, um, you know, a lot of the operational headaches that we have to deal with when you're building custom software across, you know, multiple uh, multiple applications, all in a different way, right? And, and then lastly, uh, Neuron is very, very lightweight, runs as a Windows service, um, and scales very, very easily across uh, across Windows servers, um, the cluster that I, I showed you earlier, right? So it really allows us to optimize how we use uh, our infrastructure, right? So you know th these are early days. Um, you know we're 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 using Neuron more and more. Um, we have uh, a lot of um, .NET C# -sharp developers, which makes it uh, fit for purpose for us in terms of our skill set. We're moving in that direction uh, more and more. Um, and uh, you know ultimately, you know as we move to our new platform and, and get the opportunity to eliminate a lot of our legacy, um, you know our our infrastructure will will begin to to simplify. Um, you know, over time, and because of the integration integration capabilities, um, we get to continue delivering value to our customers through existing legacy infrastructure. That that's huge for us. Um, you know, our, our stakeholders see immediate value, and at the same time, um, you know, we're we're limiting how much uh, we continue to build onto uh, our legacy platforms. 
Okay, so this, this wraps up my, my part of the presentation. I hope you found it useful and informative. Um, Joe, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. I'd like to remind all attendees that questions will be held until the end of the webinar, and they can be entered within the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. With that said, I'd like to turn it over to Marty Wozniki. Hi, everyone. Uh, Sam, that was a great presentation. Thank you again. Uh, it's hard to follow up on, and uh, hence I won't even try. <laughs> but uh, everyone, thanks for attending this presentation. Uh, I thought that was great. You know, we're uh, very proud of Neuron ESB. We're glad it can actually help customers like Thomson Reuters deliver real value uh, very quickly. Our goal with Neuron has always been to, I mean, yeah manage these slides a little better. Um, our goal with Neuron is really to increase productivity, IT optimization, and reduce that total cost of ownership. You know, Neuron ESB is, I believe, the only real commercial enterprise service bus and uh, a fairly full-featured one, I might add, that's built entirely on Microsoft.net. So when I say enterprise service bus, I mean something that can function as an integration broker, uh, business process um, uh, design, as well as service broker, so think of web service platform, integration platform. Uh, how we do all this wonderful stuff? Well, we try to really make our hallmark uh, become ease of use, uh, and hence um, we try to target just regular .NET developers, and we believe .NET developers can pick up our product very easily, very quickly, and hence they can become effective within the organization, and that relieves the outsourcing of, say, a uh, tool specialist for a project. It also allows you to grow projects organically, uh, organically in-house much quicker, much better, and deliver these solutions a lot faster. Um, and hence, that time to market and being able to leverage your own .NET existing resources really knocks down that total cost of integration. When you think of Thomson Reuters uh, and certainly uh, Sam's group, you know, Sam owns uh, a, a number of .NET developers, and these are the ones that are actually doing all the neuron work on site. It's actually not an outside consulting firm, so to speak. Uh, and that's how we're able to get a lot of these projects up the door very quickly. Uh, we do that because we provide things and tools uh, to make that happen, tools like the Neuron ESB Explorer, where you can have one-stop shopping to create everything, whether that's how we abstract with topic-based PubSub or creating, you know, um, service broker connections, uh, services that we host, or even adapter uh, connectivity, right? So connectivity is always important, um, as well as business process design. Neuron ships with its own business process designer, which is drag and drop. Again, one of our hallmarks is also extensibility, and that's important for any product. So as Sam was saying, you know, they've built a lot of reusable components. A lot of their reusable components actually show up as uh, draggable, configurable, um, process steps within our process designer, and then they have reusable services that we call as well. But it's very easy for their team to build these things because we do believe in extensibility and maybe that's writing .NET code uh, right inside our process or whether it's just various usability options. Again, all important for us. You talked about monitoring, and we do ship monitoring out of the box, and they've actually elaborated and capture more of that monitoring that we expose. So they have one-stop shop for monitoring, and then reliability and um, reliability delivery of messages very important, and being able to manage those messages that do fail and easily edit and resubmit those. So Neuron delivers all this functionality. Um, very happy with it again, and it's great that Thomson Reuters is effectively using Neuron, and uh, and Sam's team has done well, this amazing work as, as Sam showed you. Um, can't say more about that. But if you want to learn more about Neuron, feel free ping me, email me, or go to our website. You can learn more about our technology. Uh, and you can even download a trial. So feel free. And Joe, take it away. Thanks, Marty. We do have a number of questions, and this begins our Q&A session. Uh, first person has asked that we share the uh, video, and we, of course, will send that to all attendees uh, after uh, once it's been posted. So uh, look out for that. Uh, another question is how reliable are message, how reliably are message transactions happening using Neuron ESB? Okay, so you can actually configure um, in Neuron. We have topic-based PubSub that abstracts all endpoints. Uh, one of the beauties of Neuron, where 
kind of unusual in so far that we allow the user to configure the topic with the transport that will give them a certain amount of reliability. So in some cases, maybe they're doing web service traffic and maybe you want TCP as a transport for a topic. In other cases, you might want to use MSMQ as a transport for a topic or RabbitMQ. So we offer both those as alternatives and we abstract that from the user. So they can just go in, select the topic, configure it in the dropdown for MSMQ. With MSMQ, they could choose durability, transactions, and that ensures an end-to-end -end transaction with whatever they're dealing with. Um, and if they're using RabbitMQ, again, they can select that from the dropdown and choose whether they want durable, um, durable messaging or not. And then we manage all the underlying semantics. So, so th this is one of the things that um, really attracted me to Neuron, the fact that um, the underlying protocol for for transmitting these messages um, was up to the consumer. Well, it depended obviously on what um, was was provided, right? But a lot of that stuff uh, is abstracted away from our engineers, right? They just have their service endpoints. Uh, Neuron, you know, once the uh, the protocol is configured, manages um, the delivery of the messages, and that's all done, you know, in in the messaging, uh, the underlying messaging. Um, platform itself, right? So all that's abstracted away, but yes, it is all handled, um, you know, by the, 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 uh, the protocol that was selected by the user. Thank you, Marty and Sam. Uh, another question, uh, you mentioned earlier, Sam, that you evaluated some other products before choosing Neuron. Someone's asked what made you choose Neuron over some of the other products that were available. So some ease of use, right? flexibility, uh, the fact that we're predominantly a .NET shop, right? Uh, we could not find, with the exception of BizTalk, we couldn't find anything that was uh, .NET um, focused, right? Uh, and cost, right? Um, you know, th those are the, the main elements. Um, and obviously, you know, we, 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 uh, we tested against our use cases and it, uh, it fit the bill. Right, so when you add all that up, it's a pretty compelling story uh, when you compare it to some of the alternatives. Great, thanks, Sam. Now the question: How is the product monitor monitoring happening using Neuron ESP for multiple applications? Using Neuron ESP for multiple applications. Okay, so I, I'll assume um, we're talking about the compose the composable solutions that we build on top of Neuron. Right, so essentially we have these. These shared services uh, that we make available, our uh, engineers then reuse those services and build solutions, and those solutions are represented as endpoints um, or as code that runs inside uh, a neuron process. Um, what we do is we expose a monitoring queue. Each of those applications, we have a built-in library uh, that traps all of your, uh, your, your logging and error codes. Those are written to a queue. Right, one queue, um, and there's a component that reads from that queue, uh, takes all those log messages, and then integrates with something we call GMI, which is uh, the component that's used by our operations team to monitor our applications. Right, and those messages get written up onto um, a big board that has green, yellow, and and red lights, um, and they respond to uh, to those error messages. Uh, by uh, reading through a runbook that we provide to them, right? So the whole, the whole key here is that we use Neuron, right, as uh, the the platform to um, to route messages uh, that are generated by our applications uh, to a topic where we have a separate application that essentially consumes from that topic and processes uh, those uh, those error messages and pushes them downstream to our monitoring system. Uh, you can also monitor too. Um, so we actually expose everything via WMI events, WMI performance counters. So uh, you can actually get fairly granular, right? On every endpoint, you can actually monitor the data received, messages per second, uh, errors, warnings, things of that nature. You can actually uh, trap the failed message events, right, and forward those on. And I think um, that's actually being done as Thompson wrote as well, where um, they have a separate service capturing that information and forward it on to, uh, I think, Sam, that's GSI, correct? GMI, yeah. GMI. GMI. Right. Yep. Yeah. So augmenting a lot of that monitoring data. So, so the key there was to, to, was to trap all that data, and then we had to integrate it with our monitoring platform. We have a standard here called GMI 
very easy. Uh, you know, send that stuff on to to a, to a topic, and our component reads it all, and and then converts it into the format for our, for our uh, monitoring system, and is made available to our operations teams. Thanks, guys. The next question is: How much custom coding in .NET was required to build all of these integrations, and what is the percentage in relation to configuration? So the, the integrations themselves, very, very little custom code, right? Um, it, de it depends on where the integration was happening. When I gave you the example of um, our Austin Directors database, um, basically they had to write a web service, right? Um, expose some, met some methods, um, uh, and Neuron would call that web service, uh, simple HTTP, um, uh, web service, pass on the XML payload, uh, call a method, right? That was exposed by uh, the Office and Directors Development Team, and and that was that was about it, right? Um, in terms of the client connectors, um, you know, we set up a client connector, we configure it, um, and then the external system calls the client connector, um, pass on the data. That's pretty much a a configuration for the most part, right? So you know, a, a, the majority of our code begins to center around our business logic more than anything else, right? And not on a lot of the integration, um, you know, uh, nitty-gritty that we had to deal with by ourselves, right? And that's that's the beauty of what uh, Neuron um, delivers for us. Thank you, Sam. Next question may be from Marty. Is this fully a developer application? Uh, this person is wondering to what level a non-programmer could work with Neuron. A non-programmer, uh, to extend it, you do have to have some C-sharp skills. Uh, having said that, there's a lot of use cases. There are a number of use cases that don't require C-sharp skills at all, right? We really try to ship productivity out of the box. So in other words, let's uh, take, for example, a process designer. Uh, our process designer isn't just about shapes that control, uh, say, flow, right? I think we have 34 shapes, and many of them do very functional things like you know, read write to a queue, read write to an ODBC database, et cetera, uh, you know, call services, uh, execute rules, things of that nature. So in many cases, you can do simply a lot of things just through configuration. Um, but having said that, having some C-sharp skills, it's always going to be helpful. Uh, we worked with one company, a very, uh, very large pharmaceutical company, uh, where the gentleman there, uh, he had some database skills, but he didn't have any .NET skills. And, uh, he's basically the main driver and developer for their applications today in Neuron. And they've done some fairly sophisticated ones. Great. Thanks, Marty. Uh, next question, are the WCF services hosted within Neuron? Yes, they are. OK. Um, how would you handle the multiple deployments of new versions of the ESB applications? Is that a clear question? Hmm. Yeah, that might not be perfectly clear. We'll look at that and, and try to get back to the person who asked it after the webinar. Um, next question is for Sam. What is GMI? Is it built in Neuron ESB? Right. So, so GMI is um, our monitoring platform that we use. So all the apps we build in Thomson Reuters need to be able to generate messages in a certain format that are read by, by GMI. Um, and processed, right? So it's, it's, GMI is basically our uh, our um, monitoring platform. We built a component that sits in Neuron that um, processes error messages from our applications um, and then generates the format of the message that's required by GMI and calls an API, right? Um, so we just built, we built sort of an adapter that sits in Neuron that, that that's able to translate messages into what's required for our, our message for our, for our message. Uh, sorry, our monitoring platform. Thank you, Sam. Uh, let's see here. I think we have one last uh, question about GMI. Is it a web or Windows application? Uh, no, GMI um, is actually a Unix app. Okay, actually. Linux application, actually. OK, and a new question. If there's any upgrade done on Neuron, will an upgrade of your application be necessary, or or does it just work? 
It would be for Marty, I suppose. And what's the question again? If there's an upgrade to Neuron, will it be automatically upgraded on Sam's end or not? Well, so on, on, on Thompson Reuters side, they would have to upgrade the application, and they would do a rolling upgrade. So our configuration store exists on each Neuron server. So the upgrade, they would simply take one server out of the balancer, the load balancer, so to speak. They would upgrade that server, bring it back in, uh, and then work on the next one, the next one, the next one. That's the easiest way to do that. That way, if there's any changes that we make, uh, any upgrades we make to the actual configuration, it doesn't affect the rest of the farm. Great. Thank you, Marty. That does it for questions. If anyone has questions uh, or thinks of anything, they can feel free to email them to uh, neuroninfo at newdesic.com. Uh, I'd like to run a, a few quick polling questions and appreciate everyone's feedback. Um, we like to keep track of our webinars and our marketing efforts. The first question is, was this content helpful and informative, I should say? Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that feedback. Just three questions here. The next question, um, are you interested in a personalized demonstration or free trial of Neuron ESB? Give just folks a few seconds to answer that. I'm conscious of everyone's time. Thank you for staying a few minutes over. And just our last question, we like to keep track of our, our marketing efforts and filling the webinars. We just ask, you know, how did you hear about this web webinar? Was it email, Facebook, Twitter, or other? Terrific. I'd like to thank our presenters today, Sam and Marty, and thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webcast, and you are now free to disconnect. Have a great day.